35 years, he became Ireland's most loved and loathed politician. It was unbelievable, you know. And he just walked in among you and somehow or other you felt something was happening. Like It was either you loved them or you hated them. And in my case, I disliked them intensely. He wanted to be remembered as a great Irish leader, but couldn't hide his fatal flaws. I would concede there's a dark side there. I can't explain it. Um, I'm his friend, and it's happened. But looking back now, I'm very, very disillusioned. As his secret financial past is finally exposed, Tonight, we trace the role that money has played in the career of Charles J. Hawhey. In the autumn of his years, Hawhey can look back on a career of many triumphs, but it's one besmirched by a secret financial past. His secrets helped him live as a rich man, but it wasn't always like that for Charles Hawhey. Ahi was one of seven children, raised in the working-class Dublin suburb of Donny Kearney. At school in St. Joseph's or Joey's, he was marked out as a bright pupil. Well, I must say he came up the hard way. Like he, The thing that I appreciated about him a lot was that <clears throat> he was born in Donny Kearney. He went to Marino schools where I went, though I was a little behind him. And uh, he moved on down, down to Joey's, like, you know. He was there as the, the one who won his scholarships and his right to a place and went on to study accountancy. And that's a marvellous achievement for a man coming from Donny Kearney. Like, you know, he, he had it, in other words. Learning and growing up in North Dublin left its mark. His school produced a clutch of Fianna Fáil ministers, including George Colley. Well, I first came into politics on a personal basis. Uh, I. Some friends of mine, uh, Harry Boland for one, George Colley for another, were involved in the Fianna Fáil uh, organization. Uh, I came into the Fianna Fáil organization on the basis of a personal friendship with them when we were all still at school. But any school friendship with Colley was soon replaced by an enduring rivalry. My father knew him of old and knew what kind of person he was. Um, he. I suppose, uh, would always have kept his distance, would always have been aware of the, the, the difference in them, uh, between them, uh, in their motivation, um, in their approach to life generally. By his mid-twenties, Hawhey was climbing the social ladder fast. His marriage to Maureen, the daughter of Taoiseach Sean Lamas, brought him fame to add to his qualifications in accountancy and law. Political success followed soon after. Hahi and other scholarship boys like him were fast becoming a new establishment for a new decade. They found a home in Fianna Fáil. Donegal Malley and Brian Lennon and Charlie Hahi were known at that stage as the Three Musketeers. They were the youngest members of Sean Lamass's cabinet and they were very close friends. I think they saw themselves as fairly special people. I think they possibly felt that some of their peers were rather old-fashioned and not witted to a great extent. And the world, I, I, as I say, I wasn't involved with, with, with any aspect of politics, but you met other politicians with them. But I think the fact that they were together and friends, I think, argues that they saw themselves as a sort of a group, a special group, who were going to go places, and of course they all did. The Withit Scholarship Boys saw themselves as the ideal people to fulfil Sean Lamass's vision of a more modern Ireland. I think I'd be very ambitious for the future of my country. I'd, I'd be very ambitious to improve the standard of living and the quality of life of the uh, Irish people, in, in regard to things of this sort, that I would regard myself as being ambitious. 
But unlike Le Mas, it wasn't always clear that Hockey saw the difference between using his talents for his country's good and using them for his own good. He had three degrees before the age of 24. He was a scholarship boy. He did it the hard way. I suspect that Charlie, early on in life, perhaps as early as teen, his teen years, decided that he had only one life and he might as well pass through this life first class. And if the national interest coincided with that, that was it. If it didn't, it also didn't matter. From his earliest days in government, Ahi faced allegations that he blurred the line between the national interest and his own interest. When he first became a minister, he still had a thriving accountancy practice, Hahi Boland. In 1962, Fine Gael demanded to know why the accounting firm of Hahi and Boland, one partner of which is the son-in-law of the Taoiseach, had received lucrative government contracts which hadn't gone out to tender. But those were tribunal-free days and the allegations were shrugged off. At the same time, the first rumours began to surface that Hahi was involved in land and property speculation. Many of those rumours centred around Hahi's friendship with Donna O'Malley, who was buying up land in his expanding native Limerick. Primetime has found one house-building company, Rima Ireland, in which O'Malley was the main director, and another active participant, and indeed the company's secretary, was Charles J. Hahi. In Limerick, the pairing raised eyebrows. One local solicitor who dealt with the company on a land deal noted at the time that the directors included C. Hohi TD and Donna O'Malley. He wrote of an extraordinary anxiety to grab up building sites near the new airport and said, it appears to me that somebody has got some inside knowledge. Already, Hohi was attracting a certain reputation but his political career forged ahead. He became Minister for Justice, and then the youngest finance minister in Europe. And he combined business and politics when he asked a business friend to set up a Ways and Means Committee to raise funds for Fianna Foyle. And we're not taking no for an answer. Okay. Charlie Hawhey was uh, National Director of Elections, and he approached me to collect funds to fight general elections. I uh, brought together a number of friends of mine uh, to join a committee. And we des decided that a, for the major political party in Ireland to have a committee called the Ways and Means Committee uh, was akin to a small hockey club or rugby club or whatever. And we decided to change the name. Uh, and we decided on the name TACA. TACA, meaning support, organised social functions and seminars where its businessmen members had ready access to ministers. But some within the party were distinctly uneasy about TACA. It had a bad name because it was all speculation people who were putting the money into it. Uh, I'm not sure actually who started it, but it was a way of getting money in, and I think you had to pay £100 to go to it, and it had a very bad you know, to, to the only working class person in front of five wasn't very anxious for it. George Colley spoke of low standards in high places to describe the Taka culture around Hahi. There was a certain amount of arrogance, I think, involved in those who were in running Taka, who uh, engaged in uh, close contact with people in business. Uh, obviously, it it was beneficial to the Fianna Fáil party because money came rolling in. But there was always a suspicion that that must have meant that those who were uh, contributing, or at least some of them, were benefiting in a way that they wouldn't normally expect to, except for that. Uh, and I think um, he, he was very concerned, I suppose, for just democracy, for the party itself, uh, that this wouldn't snowball. I would disagree totally with it. Uh, there was no, and I can assure you, as far as I'm concerned, and a lot of other people, uh, there was no golden circle. There was no silver circle. In fact, there was no brass circle of any description of people around Hawaii looking for favours that they should not have received. I'm absolutely positive of that. The 60s building boom fostered a get-rich-quick culture, 
and some property developers saw Charles Hawhey as the man who could match their money with his political clout. Throughout his career, Hawhey has relied on the patronage of powerful men. One of the first was Matt Gallagher. Gallagher was an ambitious builder, a stalwart of Taka. His son Pat recently explained to the Sunday Business Post the attraction of Hawhey. Fianna Fáil was good for builders and builders were good for Fianna Fáil, he said. Everything was planned. Someone had to live in the big house and Hawhey created a marvellous situation. Thanks to the Gallaghers, Hawhey's houses were getting bigger and bigger. He began his married life in the 50s in this modest semi in Dublin's Rohini area. In 1957, on Matt Gallagher's advice, he bought a house and 50 acres in Grangemore, Rohini, where this estate was later built. Only 12 years later, after the land had been zoned for development, he sold it to Matt Gallagher for over £200,000. That spectacular deal gave him the cash to buy 200 acres of land and a stately home at Abbeville, Kinsealy, where he's lived ever since. Such an amazing turn of fortune couldn't be expected to go entirely unnoticed and it was tentatively raised during the 1969 general election campaign. Would you, would you mind Journalists you? broached the question, would the minister care to comment on the principle of politicians benefiting from rezoning? I don't want to say any more about it. Than I no. May I say this? I, I don't mind being weighed, assessed on my public performance where to be criticized, evaluated, praised, if you like, blamed on anything I do as a public person in my public office. I resent very much my private and personal affairs being the subject of a political campaign. Uh, if, if this is to be so, then let us look at everybody's personal Again, the matter was dropped, and it seemed that Hawhey would always be able to escape questions about his personal wealth. By the end of the 60s, Hawhey had a lifestyle unimaginable to most of the people he represented. Yes, indeed. I'm very happy here. Thank you, Mr. Hawhey. It's been very kind of you. But as well as wealth, he also had a decade of solid political achievement behind him. He has left a unique and fine legacy of legislation that would not be commonly recognised, you know, in the street as to what it was. For example, uh, women found that their home couldn't be sold over their heads in relation to the Succession Act of 1966 that he brought in. You know, that's 30 years ago he brought in legislation like that, way ahead of Britain. The legislation he brought in, obviously, about old age pensioners and, you know, the free travel and that, easy to bring in his days, giving away the state money, but he did it, and he did it against considerable opposition. And there's many acts on our books which are too comprehensive and maybe obscure to go into here, and he really pushed them through. The most important uh, piece of legislation C.J. Howe ever got involved in, to my mind, was done at a very early stage in 1969 when he dreamed up the idea of a tax-free status for artists, for poets, painters, sculptors, playwrights in Ireland. And that has had a tremendous effect, I think, today on the buoyancy of the arts and the amount of people involved in the arts. The artists of Ireland owe him a great debt. Becoming a patron of the arts fitted perfectly with Hawhey's new lifestyle. His decade's work had brought benefits for the country and a great many benefits for himself. To some, that was part of his appeal. Do you think people liked that about him, that he had uh, a beautiful house and he had done very well for himself? Did that make him more appealing or more impressive to people? It did to the people uh, uh, of uh, Martin Kulak type of thing, because they always treated him as one of their own. The, the local boy made good type of thing. There was always that attitude about it. And, uh, no, generally speaking, they were delighted with him. But even within his own constituency party, there were some who wondered where all this conspicuous wealth was coming from. It was a, it was a big question. It was always a question that was being asked. It was never answered. Um, sometimes you'd be told, well, he had this house in, in, in Rohini, in Grange Moor, and that he did extremely well on the sale of that house. And he probably did. But that didn't explain the apparent wealth that was, that was uh, disclosed 
by his his day-to-day -day living. What was the attitude within Fianna Fáil to asking the question, where did he get all this money? Well, it was none of our business, really. Um, sure, wasn't he doing a great job? Um, if he was doing a great job, sure, leave him, leave, leave him, leave him at it. Even as he settled into the big house, Ahi was at pains to give the impression that thoughts of personal wealth were as remote to him as to anyone else. Does a million pounds mean anything to you as Minister for Finance? Not at all, no. I, I find it just as difficult as anybody else to grasp the idea of what a million is. On the whole, then, but he didn't find it difficult to grasp for long. Even as Hahi protested his indifference to personal wealth, he was taking steps to ensure he became as wealthy as possible. Primetime has learned that for several years during the 1960s, while he was a minister, Hahi paid no income tax at all, even on his ministerial salary. In those days, people were allowed to claim tax relief on the interest they paid when they borrowed money from a bank. Hahi claimed so much of this tax relief that he ended up telling the revenue commissioners that he had no taxable income at all, even as he grew visibly more wealthy. Normally, a tax return like that would cause serious inquiries by the revenue commissioners. But we understand that even though some of their staff had strong misgivings, the revenue decided that it was better not to ask too many questions of Ireland's rising political star. The idea of a Minister for Finance paying no income tax, however legally, is so remarkable that it comes as a surprise even to some of Hahi's close confidants. Well, as I understand it, uh, it was allowed at the time that interest on bank loans could be offset against all income. So that that's if been, that's been around for many, many years. It's not specific to him as Minister of Finance, speaking no. as I say as a charged accountant, not by any means, no. And it was perfectly legal. But it's not very appropriate for somebody who's a Minister of Finance. Sorry, I don't, I don't follow that insofar as he hadn't got borrowings. So how could he offset the interest against what? We gather now that that is a fact, Dad. Well, certainly I haven't heard that, and I have no knowledge of that, and what? that's news to me. Hahi was now rich, powerful, and bound for the very top. But although it seemed life couldn't be better, disaster was just around the corner. All these rumours, and, and, and not, most of them, as you know, always have been against him. So I have been malicious. From the time he first went into the public eye, there have been malicious rumours against him. And this, of course, is the best one of all. As the decade turned, Hahi was to become still more controversial. Even when he was injured falling from his horse, his friend and solicitor Pat O'Connor had to publicly deny unfounded rumours that he'd actually been beaten up. Hahi saw off those rumours, but by that stage he was embroiled in a much bigger controversy, one that wouldn't simply go away. In 1970, Hahi was one of two government ministers charged with helping to smuggle arms to Northern Republicans. This was the scene outside the Dublin District Court today as the two former ministers were charged. Hahi was acquitted of criminal charges but sacked as a minister. The arms crisis had been a disaster for his political career. Typically, though, he sounded a defiant note after his acquittal. Those who were responsible for the debacle have no alternative now but to take the honourable course which is open to them. Not surprisingly, the Fianna Fáil leadership didn't accept Hahi's invitation to stand down. And at the start of the 70s, it was Hahi's own political career that was headed for the wilderness. I enjoyed power because the things power enabled you to do. And I think that's the important thing about power, uh, that you use it use it to shape things, to improve things, to develop things. And I certainly miss that very much. Hahi was determined not to miss power for too long. He turned to the party's grassroots and spent years touring the country and building up his personal following. He worked night and day to get back, to get his status back within the party. It, it, it became a bit of a legend in that period, like, you know, that Charlie was down in Kilkenny, Charlie was in Castlebar, Charlie was up in Letterkenny, and 
functions that he had attended, like, you know. And yet you, you try to work out this, uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, how does he do it? At the same time, Hahi made sure his constituency base remained solid. No matter was too small to receive the personal attention of the minister in exile. Here are some letters, Mr. Hahi, on behalf of your help you gave me before in many cases. And yeah. they, say, they said I'm just one in a million. Yeah. You know, with the one baby, they won't be yeah. anywhere. Do any found people in, in, in real financial difficulties, he'd take a checkbook out of his pocket and he'd write them a check for their ESP bill or their rent, which, you know, they, they'd get into difficulties and he'd just write them out a check. No problem at all. I move on. And that kind of generosity is very hard to find anywhere. I, I think it was fantastic, like, you know. Joe Flynn, Rory O'Connor coming, Dublin... As a result, Hahi's popularity actually grew during the early 70s and his appearance at an Ordesh was guaranteed to generate excitement. In addition, the arms crisis had given Hahi a new image, one which was to prove very useful. And many people looked at him as the most caring politician for the North, but they would look upon himself and Niall T. Blaney as two very good people and had, well, the nationalists in the North more at heart than a lot of us. And do you think that that image then endured for him for a lot of years after? Oh, yes. Even yet with some people. His nationalist image aroused such passions, completely buried. Once the arms trial situation came in and Mr. Hoy became the kind of spokesperson for the Republican, and he, he himself, of course, obviously spoke quite a lot about that, and he saw within the Fianna Fáil or the Ardishes that was very much used. And I think very few then could start challenging him on the money side because they had no, nobody knew exactly, there was no definite proof of what the situation was financially. Like. There may have been no proof of where the money came from, but there was plenty of proof of where it was going. Hahi added an island and a yacht to his collection of status symbols. As his visible wealth increased, so did the rumours of his connections to property developers. He was very much involved with business people, much so than any minister that I know of, he was obviously well known for making representation for people in Dublin, especially in the business, in the, in the business end of things. And I suppose he'd have been associated with builders, and then as you, at the time, of course, in Dublin, many builders in Dublin at that time were in a position that they build government buildings, that the offices for government departments were built by these builders. Some builders had several office blocks leased by the state, including John Byrne, Hottie's friend. Having the state as a long-term tenant was an excellent deal for a property developer and greatly enhanced the value of any building, buildings like John Byrne's O'Connell Bridge house. The rumours linking Hahi and Byrne were so strong that Hahi's old adversary put his foot down. In the late 70s, George Colley was Minister for Finance and he put a stop to the state's proposed leasing of this building, John Byrne's Sean Lamass House on Stevens Green. I do remember that a certain individual's name as being the developer arose and that my father felt that there was a very close connection between this individual and Mr. Hawhey and that there was such a close connection that either it was inappropriate or could be seen to be inappropriate to, to le take the lease. And I do remember him telling me at some point, and I can't remember when, but it was obviously some time after it occurred uh, that, that he had vetoed it. Watching old rivals like Collie overtake him on the political ladder was a bitter pill, but no one was climbing the social ladder faster than Hahi. Despite officially having a modest income, Hahi spent like a millionaire. In 1971, he owed his bank AIB 255,000 pounds. By 1976, his debts had reached half a million pounds. And by 1979, after a decade of lavish spending, he was in the red to the tune of well over a million pounds. In public, he maintained the facade of being unconcerned about material riches. Richness has been able to leave, live a, a full life, a satisfying life, 
be able to achieve something, to be of help and assistance to the community in which one lives. But in private it was a different story. He told AIB that his lifestyle was crucial to his prestige. Bank memos show him mixing promises with threats, offering to use his influential position to help the bank, but warning that if they called in his debt, he'd be a very troublesome adversary. It worked. AIB held its hand. Hahi was able to return to government as Minister for Health and Social Welfare. Back in cabinet, he was well placed when Taoiseach Jack Lynch stood down. Pleased to elect a successor to Mr. Lynch. It now looks as though it'll be a straight contest between the Thornister and Minister for Finance, Mr. Colley, and the Minister for Health, Mr. Hahi. George Colley had the support of the entire cabinet, apart, of course, from Hahi himself. But Hahi made his pitch to the backbenchers, offering them the prospect of promotion to government. I want to uh, give you the result of the election which has just taken place. The result, the result was Charles Hahi, 44, uh, George Colley, 38. Against the odds, Hahi had claimed the ultimate the prize. And Taoiseach Meherden, Mr. Charles J. At his first audacious Taoiseach, the man privately described by the country's biggest bank as totally irresponsible with money, began lecturing the country. As a community, we have been living beyond our means. Neither internally nor externally have we been paying our way. And on both fronts, we have been borrowing simply to keep going. This situation must be got under control and the very high rate of borrowing reversed. And it can be got under control if we follow the old-fashioned, sensible doctrine of living within our means. But when it came to solving his own debts, Hahi took a very different approach, one that didn't involve living within his means. Becoming Taoiseach had worked wonders on his bank balance. He was able to wipe out years of debt with a wave of his hand when in early 1980 he pulled up outside AIB headquarters and tossed the bank a cheque. AIB settled for £750,000, but it was only a temporary solution. Hahi had solved one decade's debts, only to instantly begin another decade of financial problems. Where did the money come from? Half of it, arranged by his accountant Des Trainer, came from another bank. And by his own admission, the other half came from Patrick Gallagher. But why would Gallagher give Hahi £375,000? It was, in effect, a down payment on a long-standing plan, confirmed by the AIB memos, that, like his father before him, Pat Gallagher would buy some of Hahi's land once it was rezoned for housing. But before the land could be rezoned, Hahi would need the help of another property developer. John Byrne and his massive development plan called Endcamp. If Endcamp gets the go-ahead in its present form, it could open up great stretches of the North County for development. That could benefit Mr. Hawhey and a lot of other not so well-known people. The Endcamp development at Baldoyle next door to Hawhey would have provided sewage access for the area and so unlocked the door to rezoning of Hawhey's own land. So even if Hahi had no direct stake in Byrne's proposal, both men stood to make millions if the county council approved it. The rumours of Hahi's connection to Endcamp were so strong that both men vigorously denied it. Absolute rubbish. Mr. Hahi has no interest whatsoever, directly or indirectly. Has he ever had? Never had. Well, why do you think the rumours are so persistent then? Well, because I think this is the rumour-mongering that's going around. Uh, Mr. Hawhey is supposed to own half of Ireland, as far as I can see. But that denial is difficult to reconcile with AIB documents, which suggest Hawhey actually had a direct stake in Byrne's development. Bank memos from 1979 note that Hawhey was expecting to make money from a development in Baldoyle, and that this was apart altogether from any sale of his own land. Hahi even mentioned a figure of £200,000. Primetime has been unable to identify any other development in Baldoyle to which this could refer. While he was waiting for this plan to come off, Hahi attacked the job of Taoiseach with gusto. 
he set out a style of leadership which many of those around him admired. He was a very decisive man in terms of being Taoiseach and uh, he would rapidly detect whether this was a good idea or not, whether he wanted something done or not, and then he would see to it that it was done. He was decisive in a very good managerial way. But that decisiveness also manifested itself as a desire for total control of his party. And for Hahi, that meant controlling the money. As soon as he became leader, Hahi set about taking over the Fianna Fáil party finances. Since Jack Lynch had scrapped Toca, election fundraising had been in the hands of Senator Des Hannafin. He kept the names of big party donors secret from ministers to avoid allegations of Toca style conflicts of interest. Hahi knew that those names were the key. By the 1982 election in February, he had them and his election agent Pat O'Connor bypassed Hannafin and went directly to the big donors on Hahi's behalf. Pat O'Connor obviously had got the records, and these obviously were records of the names, addresses and amounts previously subscribed by these particular people. And it would appear that he got those records uh, before the election was actually called, or just as it was called, and got out there, got out of the traps fairly fast and made contact either uh, verbally or by, um, by correspondence, seeking donations for the party but really for the constituency of Dublin North Central. And these were monies that should have gone, in the normal course, to uh, the party nationally. And what happened then when the party nationally contacted these people for their normal subscription to the party? Well, they discovered that uh, the money had already been subscribed. They were told, well, you know, what do you want? We've already subscribed uh, money. We've, we've given it to Pat O'Connor, who's the election agent for the leader of the party and you know, we're quite happy that we've given it to the party. But they didn't realise it was being diverted into the constituency of Dublin North Central for the purpose of helping to elect uh, Mr. Hahi. And you know that that money, once it was diverted to Dublin North Central, was never accounted for. That's correct. To anybody. <laughs> Hahi returned to power at that election but huge sums donated to the party had come under his personal control. Only he knew how much or where it would go, giving him unprecedented power. That money has never been accounted for. Yet some of the financial watchdogs in his constituency remain unconcerned. Would you be quite happy that nothing went astray out of that money? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh those monies were raised for the election and used for the election, you know. And there'd be no problem with that at all. No, I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever, please. I, I don't know why you're even bothering with me, asking me. Uh, Des Hannafin wasn't in a position to ask questions. How he had had him sacked, giving himself control of the party finances. But Paul McKay didn't let the matter rest. He wrote to every Fianna Fáil TD, telling them what had happened, and took his case to the national executive. Well, I was brought into a room. Um, there was uh, all the members of the national executive, and most of them were there, which is roughly around about 70 to 80 people. I was ushered to a, a, a chair and a table. I was told to make my submission uh, by the chairman, Mr. I, and um, that took about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I was told, thank you very much, you may now go. And I was ushered out. They didn't ask you any questions? None whatsoever at all. They didn't and express any surprise? No, no, or no. And to me, this meeting was, uh, being it was being controlled. That obviously the meeting had started before I arrived. Uh, people were told, say nothing, do nothing, get this fella in quick and get him out fast. The national executive didn't investigate McKay's query. In fact, McKay himself was expelled from the party. It was just one example of what happened to those Hahi saw as disloyal. The party became bitterly divided. The intense loyalty of his supporters was used to intimidate Hahi's opponents. The audition was most interesting. It was as if uh, you were treated like a token member of the opposition who was sort of brought in uh, so that you could personally experience the, the whoops of, of, of support and acclamation for the leader and the howls of derision for, for his enemies whenever they were mentioned. 
And of course, I mean, you, you were then subsequently treated as the worst form of enemy, the enemy within. The split over Hahi's leadership got worse and worse. In 1982 and early 83, Fianna Fáil underwent three bitter leadership heaves. Many felt the rules of political conflict had been torn up. TDs and their families experienced intimidation. It was late at night. It was very abusive, uh, sickening language, really appalling. I was sick and utterly, really. I, you, you feel terrible when you get an abusive call because um, it's, not, it's not fair on a wife to have to listen to abuse about their husband. You have to capture the atmosphere of that time. I think the party was invited at that time in a radio interview by, by uh, Mr. Hahi. Uh, to the, the organisation was invited to contact their local TDs and express their opinions. And they did that with some ferocity, I want to tell you. You know, the, they just kept ringing and ringing and writing and telling you, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a party secretary in this county and uh, I want you to support Mr. Hahi and so on. Were some uh, you know, phone calls it, obscene? Yeah, call? yeah, they were, but uh, you know, they were. But uh, I suppose I wouldn't pay much heed to them. I suppose when, when, now that I'm a little bit older. But um, in those days, they quite frightened me. Yeah. And you, you, you think he's he's the one person to lead Fianna Fáil into the next general election? But many ordinary yes. members who supported Hahi felt he was being betrayed. No Charlie Hahi, no Fianna Fáil. Fine. To Thank some, the cause of keeping Charlie in power justified extreme measures. I knew uh, from some people in Dublin South that Seamus Brennan came under severe pressure. Um, and what did you think of that at the time? Well, do you, you mean on the heaves and how to change the vote? Um, again, my thinking on that was that we get our man in, we want Charlie in. And that's what the end justified the means. The end justified the means. Throughout it all, Hahi sought to downplay the political battle which was underway for his survival. <laughs> Mr. Hahi, is there any significance in the fact that Mr. O'Malley is not present? None at, at all. The press no, conference? No, no, no. None at all. No, this None the, at the all. people are here, just a few colleagues who happen to be uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are, we are, and the message I want to keep on repeating, we are a totally united party, having arrived at a unanimous decision without any uh, dissent whatsoever at this morning's party. But Hahi's totally united party continued the bitter fight over his leadership. Later that year came the lowest point when his opponents found an angry mob waiting for them after another failed heave. I was the first that left the room and as we came down on the white stairs going up to the chamber of the house there was this mob of people coming in against us. Quite noisy and running and going as fast as they could. To be honest, the first thought that struck my head, my God, that I, they had this mob waiting in the yard out in the bars or somewhere, and there's going to be a terrible blow up here. Well, this shouldn't happen at all within the house. There's no doubt about that. It was frightening, I thought I could call it. If you took a step to mind, they were out to get you. No, I, 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 I wouldn't go on. I'm not a Charlie Basher one way or another. For I, I think he did a lot of good things. But I think democracy was really in trouble at that stage. Hahi always denied responsibility for the most extreme pressure okay. placed on his opponents, but those opponents weren't convinced. I've had my, my quota of early morning phone calls. Some people took it upon themselves, of course, but in some cases it was orchestrated and inspired, and uh, I was into that. Orchestrated and inspired by Charles Hahi himself, do you think? Well, orchestrated and inspired by, by people acting on his behalf, certainly, and I'm sure with his knowledge, um, he mightn't have been involved in being told about or inspiring every particular incident that ever happened to everybody, but certainly he was well aware this was going on. And I, I, I think, frankly, it was quite despicable conduct, and I resented it then, and I resented it to this day. Once again, money played a key role in Hahi's career, helping him fight his way through successive heaves. This time, money was used as a more subtle lever against those who might oppose him. No, you're not united behind me anyway. <laughs> there was one particular one I know where somebody who did have a, a dependence on a particular form of livelihood 
and um, he received a phone call on the, the morning, I think, or the night before, one of the heaves indicating that if he did not vote for Mr. Hawhey, uh, that uh, part of his livelihood would be removed. Now, this was not a call directly from Mr. Hawhey, um, but it was made quite clear to him that uh, that would be removed. Primetime can reveal that the TD involved was David Andrews, then an anti hockey backbencher and a barrister. The phone calls came from Joe Moore, then the chief executive of PMPA Insurance and a strong hockey supporter. Moore threatened to withdraw PMPA's lucrative legal work from Andrews if he voted against hockey. Andrews stood his ground, but he wasn't the only TD to experience similar pressure from Moore. For some of Hahi's opponents, this constant pattern of drawing together money and political power confirmed the reasons behind their mistrust of him. Nobody had any concrete information. I mean, I had worked before my election to Dáil and I had worked for several years with a large accountancy firm in Dublin. Uh, we had, amongst our clients, many of the major banks and financial institutions. So I suppose I was more exposed to many of the rumours concerning Mr Hahi than most or maybe all of my contemporaries in the parliamentary party, but, but th that's all they, they were at the time, rumours, but I did have a, have a large degree of exposure for a long time uh, to those rumours. And did what you hear disturb you? Yes, I have to say, yeah, I, I, I have to say it did. Not, not, not just the nature of what I heard, but the sort of sources from which I was hearing it, which, which I would normally have regarded as pretty good sources. The principal rumour, of course, was of Hahi's connection to John Byrne and his development at Baldoyle. Hahi may have won the political battle for his leadership, but his opponents were to extract a heavy financial price. One of Hahi's main opponents, the TD Martin O'Donoghue, tipped off Gareth Fitzgerald about Hahi's rumoured connection to Byrne and his interest in the Encamp scheme being approved. When the proposal next came before Dublin County Council, Gareth Fitzgerald discouraged his councillors from supporting it. The Encamp proposal, and with it Hahi's chances of becoming a millionaire in his own right, collapsed. Despite this, Hahi continued to live the life of a millionaire. From now on, he would become increasingly reliant on handouts from business associates. But to whom could he turn? From 1982, Patrick Gallagher was out of the picture because his property empire had collapsed. Hahi turned to new sources. We now know that hotelier P.V. Doyle gave him £90,000 in 1983. And in 1987, the biggest donor of all, Ben Dunn, entered the picture. You can stand here. Have you any of those dollar bills? I do. Uh, I hate to bribing an ex-private. I want a dollar. I want a dollar. I want a dollar. Spend it right. Hahi continued to hobnob with the rich and famous. His acceptance of handouts remained a secret. Absolutely. He became Taoiseach again in the spring of 87. In the years that followed, he achieved a great deal, and many give him credit for getting to grips with the Irish economy. I would have to say, first and foremost, of course, the uh, introduction of social partnership into the running of our economy. Secondly, I think the Financial Services Centre. He was the one who took up Dermot Desmond's idea and uh, insisted that this Financial Services Centre be created. Uh, it has been hugely successful. I remember the first meeting we had about it, lots of people came with buckets of cold water and said this could never happen. But it has happened, there are six and a half thousand people employed. Uh, Temple Bar was again uh, an achievement of his in Dublin that he pushed through, piloted the legislation through the Dáil himself. He was also ultimately the person who pressed to have the, tre the National Treasury Management Agency set up. There's a whole list of these radical changes which uh, still exist and are still having their influence uh, on our economy and on our social life. At the same time, the Ben Dunn payments were flowing into Hahi's accounts. In the five years beginning just before his return to power, Ben Dunn gave Hahi a total of £1.8 million. Hahi's apparent inability to serve the state without serving himself was most evident during this period. Even as he built a legacy of achievement, he was putting in place the rot that would eat away at that legacy. 
There is that contradiction there, I, I quite agree with you. His accomplishments uh, were quite extraordinary during that period. As I say, he is the genesis of the economic boom. He also got the Financial Services Centre going against a bit of opposition. You know, it wasn't seen as kind of the right thing to do, but we look at it now, even Sheriff Street Flats, the worst economic address in Dublin has now become the best economic address with Citibank moving its European fund headquarters there. And certainly there is a contradiction there. Um, I can't explain it. Dunn and Tahi now maintained that the money was given for no particular reason. But that wasn't always Ben Dunn's story. In 1993, he told a member of his family trust that he'd given the money in order to influence the laws affecting that trust, which had come to the end of its life and was facing a £30 million tax bill. Ben Dunn later backed off that story at a tribunal. But the £30 million tax bill was dismissed by the Revenue Appeal Commissioners in 1988, the year after Ben Dunn's payments to Charles Hockey began. However, the two surviving appeal commissioners who heard that case have both told Primetime that there was no political interference in their decision. So for now, the Ben Dunn payments remain unexplained. While he remained in office, Hockey managed to keep his financial secrets under wraps. In 1990, Dick Spring wrote to Hockey shortly before Patrick Gallagher was jailed for fraud and asked whether Gallagher had ever given Hockey any money. Hockey replied, I categorically reject your outrageous suggestions and find it deeply offensive that you would write to me in this tone. Once again, the matter was dropped. Hockey was able to retire from politics two years later with his financial secrets apparently secure. As he departed, he had a suitable political epitaph in mind. I'm very proud of the fact that I did survive here for 35 years. Uh, it's a great thing to be a member of Dáil Éireann, which I regard as the outward symbol of the independence of this nation. And also to have an opportunity of taking part in the ebb and flow of national life uh, for those long years. For years, his admirers had responded to many crises with the phrase, you'll never catch Charlie. Now it seemed they were right, but they weren't. Mr. Hawhey admitted that Ben Dunn gave him £1.3 million and accepted the evidence that Mr. Dunn handed him £210,000 at Concealy. Mr. McCullough said Mr. Hawhey lied to the tribunal on three occasions. Mr. Hawhey said he had always known at the back of his mind that disclosure was inevitable. So far, tribunals have uncovered handouts and write-offs totaling around £3 million. Hawhey's wealth had given rise to so many legends of amazing deals that the realisation he was in fact a kept man was a great surprise to his long-time admirers. When the news broke, I suppose two years ago, it came as a great shock to me. Uh, disappointment and... Um, something I couldn't understand, you know, it was an enormous puzzle as far as I was concerned, knowing him, that this had happened. Among his own people, Hockey had always been sure of finding plenty of support and respect. And even now, many will still admire and excuse him. If a friend gives him money when he's in financial difficulties, so be it. They live in a different plane altogether than maybe you and certainly a different plane than I live in, like, you know. And, uh, but if I were in difficulties and somebody said, there's £500 to take you out of your difficulties at the moment, I'd say thank you very much. But that £500 to me would be the same as a million pounds to Charlie. But for most people, the reputation as a great achiever, which Hockey strove so hard to build, has been undermined by the weakness he displayed from his earliest years, money. I don't, I don't see it as a balancing act. I think, yes, you acknowledge the good things that somebody has done. But for me and for many others, I think that the destructive element was far greater. Um, while creating uh, very interesting and, and uh, 
very effective schemes such as the Temple Bar scheme or the IFSC, uh, not to mention government buildings refurbishment. Uh, and going further back, there were, other, there were other things that I think one should uh, say were worthy. Um, the problem is that all efforts of politicians now are seen as being untrustworthy. There's, there's always suspected to be another agenda, another motive, uh, a lining of one's pockets, which eats away at, at, I think, the political system. I think Mr. Hoy's career has done an awful lot of damage. Even his supporters know that the financial secrets now being revealed will cast a shadow over his entire career. I think he will have not be remembered the way he would like to be remembered, certainly in the immediacy, um, bearing in mind that the, much of the population of Ireland is under, say, the age of 30, for example, or even under the age of 40. And bear in mind he was a Minister of Justice nearly 40 years ago. So pe it's very hard for people to understand what he actually accomplished. They only see the immediacy of what has happened. I would hope that he'd be remembered for his accomplishments, and I think on balance, I think history will be kind to him. But in the immediacy, having regard to the age of our population, I do not think that he'll be remembered the way that he would wish to be remembered. But perhaps the greatest victims are the loyal supporters who always stood by Charles Hockey. Let me say I have tremendous admiration for what he did after 1987. The government that came to office in 1987 saved this country from bankruptcy. On the other hand, the Fianna Fáil party, which has such a long record, an unrivaled record of service to this country, has certainly been tainted, has certainly been electorally adversely affected, and is likely to continue to be so because of, 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 of certain activities and certain things that were done during that period which shouldn't have been done uh, because of certain things that are now coming to light which, quite frankly, have appalled and scandalised the people of this country. And I think that is very regrettable. And I don't think that the ordinary, average man or woman who has gone out night and day taking up national collections, knocking on doors, canvassing, you know, providing the, providing the, the, the basis for this being the biggest party, political party in the country, I don't think they deserve that. They deserve better. I thought he could walk on water. I wasn't alone thinking that. I'm thinking of those people that walked night and day as well, like, you know, they must have become, in every constituency, very, very disillusioned, because he had a following. Um, they must be very disillusioned. And as I say, we, we haven't heard the end of it yet. You would agree we haven't heard the end of it yet. there and 